So it is a pleasure to be here. I have to admit I am totally intimidated by following the presentation about John Holland. I mean, <laughs> John Holland is such a major figure, um, and um, this wonderful presentation brought back such, such memories of him. He was also hysterically funny. Um, and it's so, anyway, um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and um, I have to admit this is my first trip to Florida. Don't ask me how come I never got to Florida before, but I'm quite impressed. Uh, it's a beautiful place. So, um, so let me start. I would very much like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to participate in this first plenary session um, from the perspective of um, the theory of counseling for work and relationship. Um, I was delighted to accept the invitation, but more than a bit challenged um, because I kept asking myself, um, I kept telling myself that counseling for work and relationship is not a theory. Um, so if it's not a theory, then I had to figure out what it was. Um, the paper I wrote in my presentation today represents my answer to this question. So in so doing, um, it may seem that I have veered away from the topic of the integration of theory, research, and practice. However, going down this road, I think this, um, my paper and this presentation can be read as one, as, as one answer to the question. That is, counseling for work and relationship has taken one path to the integration of theory, research, and practice, and that path is to prioritize the goals of practice. So the goal of practice is to influence and change behavior, not just to understand it. Thus, counseling for work and relationships, theoretical orientation is specified in relation to an interaction and in interaction with the goal of practice. So I think that what counseling for work and relationship is, is I think it is a practice-driven theoretical approach as opposed to a theory-driven practice. So if that makes any sense. Um, so, so, so that's my title. What I hope to do in this presentation is to talk about the goal of practice, uh, talk about uh, the theories that, uh, that constitute counseling for work and relationship. Since narrative theory is one of those theories, I'll say something about that. Um, I then want to talk about two readings of one particular principle of narrative theory that leads to two different practices. Um, if I have time, I want to talk about my favorite topic, which is unpaid care work, um, and then a conclusion. Um, so, so the goal of practice um, is central to counseling for work and relationship. Um, initially, it was formulated as to help people co-construct their lives through work and relationship, um, specifically with respect to major life contexts of market work, unpaid care work, and relationship. The articulation of this goal was influenced by social constructionism, contextualism, life course theory, and social justice and other progressive values. It also represents an evolution of the goals of practice in vocational psychology, from helping people make occupational choices, to helping people make, to, to develop careers, to helping people co-construct lives. So this goal has been revised to help people co-construct meaningful lives um, going forward through work and relationship. The addition of meaning to this goal calls attention to the fact that practitioners are not interested in helping people co-construct any kind of lives. Um, there seems to be an emerging consensus that lives of meaning are what's important. Uh, my interpretation of helping people co-construct lives of meaning um, is, to help co is to help people co-construct lives they want to live on some level. Um, this revised goal also makes explicit an orientation, uh, the, the future orientation also makes explicit what I think has always been an implicit future orientation in vocational psychology. For much of its history, vocational psychology has been about helping people make choices about the work they're going to do. Um, in counseling for work and relationship, 
It's about helping people find directionality across their lives. Um, so. so then I just want to address that the theories of human development relevant to this goal of practice are drawn from two different epistemological perspectives. The first one uh, is the objective view, <clears throat> the view from the outside. That has to do with theories of human development that take the stance of trying to understand development from, from the outside observer, as somebody who's observing uh, a development. The second epistemological perspective <clears throat> can be called the inside view. That is, attempts to understand human development <clears throat> I may need to get my water from within the ongoing stream. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hmm. So that is attempts to <clears throat> understand human development from within the ongoing stream of, subject of subjective experience that constitutes our lives, what could be called sociocultural psychology. So, counseling for work and relationship is grounded in sociocultural psychology, specifically narrative theory, and it's informed by developmental science, specifically life course theory. It is also a work in progress. There is a room for and a need for the integration of additional theories with respect to this goal of practice. So, um, so since, narrative, since counseling for work and relationship is grounded in narrative theory, I need to say a few things about narrative theory. Um, and I also have to say that narrative theory is um, a central theory for a number of contemporary theories in, vo in vocational psychology, and also for some very innovative approaches to vocational counseling practice. So I'm just talking about narrative theory in relationship to counseling for work and relationships. So to start with the middle here, um, I think it's just important to state that narrative, th that narrative theory is not an integrated body of theory. It's basically a set of principles that have been uh, relating to narrative and human development that have been developed by a number of theorists. Um, one of the basic principles, going to this first thing at the top, um, one of the basic principles of narrative theory is that narrative is a way of thinking um, ubiquitous across cultures that enables us to make sense of our subjective experience. It is narrative that keeps us from being overwhelmed by our everyday sensory experience. Narrative helps us to organize that experience. Well, the affinity of narrative theory to counseling practice is that counseling is also about helping people make sense of their experience. So this close affinity between narrative and counseling practice is a point that Leisha Hoshmund made um, about over 10 years ago, and it's absolutely critical um, for what I'm saying today. Um, so when we come to the issue of the integration of theory, research, and practice from the perspective of narrative theory, it's a natural. Because narrative is a common denominator across all three categories. Um, from the perspective of theory, the theory is all about how narrative is central to human development. The research is all about understanding human development through the stories people tell about their lives. And now there's quite a sophisticated set of methods of inquiry um, related to narrative. And finally, narrative is a central dimension of counseling practice. So, so at the bottom here, I say that, that narrative theory really enables connections across categories. However, going to this next slide, really from the perspective of narrative theory, these are not separate categories. These are very much overlapping domains. Um, and I think much more can be said about that. I'm not sure I'm quite ready to say that, what that means yet, but, but I try to illustrate this point in my paper by going through some research examples. Um, but clearly, these overlapping domains facilitates the interaction, interconnections um, across those domains. Okay. So this, this my, my journey to figure out what what counseling for work and relationship is about. It took some 
different routes. So anyway, I come to what I talk about, which is which basically um, there there are two different ways of reading one of the basic principles of narrative theory according to Ricoeur. Um, and Ricoeur was is a basic foundational narrative theorist who is most noted for um, talking about how lives fall, uh, unfold in time. He talk, really talks about the importance of, of, of narrative and lives of, of time. So this first, what's bolded in this, um, the storylines of the future, what's bolded in the, in, so, and that's my restatement. Record didn't say it exactly like that, so that's how I've said it. Um, and what I bolded there is what I emphasize in Counseling for Work and Relationship. So what's emphasized there is, um, is, is an emphasis on action. So action is central to Ricoeur's theory that, that actions arise out of the telling of narrative. Um, and action, and the whole notion of action, is also central in um, many contemporary vocational theories. Um, for example, Tom Krusik, um, uh, Mark Savickas, Richard Young, uh, John Crumbolds have all emphasized action. Um, I emphasize agentic action um, in counseling for work in relationship simply to underline that from the perspective of practitioners, uh, we want to encourage action that people on some level want to take, not just any kind of action, but agentic action, uh, something that people want to take. And so, of course, in terms of counseling for work in relationship, um, this first, it is also informed by life course theory. So it's agendic action is important across life contexts. And um, secondly there, at different points in the life cycle, different, different domains of life, different life contexts are differentially salient. Um, so, so the practice related to this could be called work in relationship counseling. Um, so this first reading of Ricoeur's basic principle is essentially about the integration of two theories with respect to practice. Um, so now to the second reading. Okay, the second reading of Ricoeur's principle has to do with psychotherapy. Um, and the second theory emphasizes the telling and the retelling of the stories of the past in the present. Um, so if you read that statement from the perspective of a practitioner, it's really the interp one can interpret that statement as that this is about psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is essentially about restoring a life. Um, it is about, psychotherapy is about constructing a more cohesive, more coherent, more consistent life story that enables a person to overcome and master problems due to past experience. Um, so this point, uh, about the close connection between psychotherapy and narrative has been made by any number of theorists. Um, Hansen made a much more sophisticated point um, that psychotherapy theories themselves are narrative structures that facilitate the restoring of lives. Um, so so this, this second reading of Ricoeur seems to be about psychotherapy. So. So if you put number one and number two together, if you put the first, if you put these two readings together, it really um, has to do with um, developing a theoretical rationale for the integration of work and relationship counseling and psychotherapy. So I, I would call that integration counseling slash psychotherapy, which is actually something I think I wrote about many, many years ago, but I never, could, I never really could get it together to come back to it. So I don't know if I've got it together yet, but anyway, I've come back to it. Um, and so, it, it, so basically, counseling and psychotherapy can be described as a practice that helps people reconstruct and co-construct stories of the past that limit them as they co-construct meaningful lives going forward through work and relationship. So this counseling slash psychotherapy is a practice that does not split past and future. It is also a practice that does not split um, the inner world from the social worlds in which people are embedded. So 
I think that's cool um, that it does that it sort of it uh, resolves those splits. For the purpose of this conference, what's interesting is that this is a theory that leads to an integration of practices. So um, I just think that's interesting. All right. So. Um, so I have time for a couple words about unpaid uh, care work, um, which is my favorite topic in the past few years. But I've come to understand that unpaid care work, which is you know, one of the three major life contexts that I think we should talk about, is a disruptive discourse. Um, it is, in many ways, it's the opposite of narrative theory. Um, it is not how people think about their lives. It is a challenge to prevailing narrative structures. It doesn't feel right. It elicits resistance. Um, the ideologies that structure our minds have effectively split off care from work. Um, so that's why it's disruptive. People don't like to hear it. Uh, my students, you know, by, the, by the end of the semester, I've convinced them it's a good idea. But I always think that they forget about it a week later. Um, so, so while I think, while I think that there's a very strong argument for um, encouraging people to think about their care as work, um, whether or not anybody besides me is going to engage in this disruptive discourse remains to be seen. Um, so, so for a long time, I thought it seemed to me that. There was just no getting beyond the fact that the only language people were willing to use was caregiving. And caregiving is really very different from unpaid care work. However, there is a note of optimism, a note, note of hope, in that Melinda Gates is now talking about unpaid work. She's not talking about unpaid care work yet, but she's talking about unpaid work in the pages of the Financial Times and the New York Times. So I'm hopeful that our ability to not be so resistant to the notion of unpaid care work uh, might actually be lessening. So, But unpaid care work is a, a disruptive discourse is kind of um, sort of a tangential to, um, it's actually very central, but it's a bit of a tangential point to the rest of this presentation. So to conclude, um, we were all asked to uh, comment on how vocational psychology, what, what vocational psychology can do to foster the integration of theory, work, and practice. And at this point, in a, other than what I've already said, I don't know that I have any more thoughts about this, except that I don't know that the goal, that integration, except, except to comment that maybe the goal of integration, integration itself, might not be the best way to think about it maybe um, connections, collaborations, dialogue, conversations across these domains um, might be um, less intimidating than the notion of integration. Um, anyway, thank you so much for listening.